Hi everyone. Um, so we'll we'll get started. Um, we only have I think like thirty minutes. <laughs> so hey, that's not bad. We killed like twelve minutes. Um, Ishman, how are you, man? It's been a while. Good, pretty good. Good, good, good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, all is good. Uh, life is getting back to normal, which is great. Uh, <laughs> fingers, fingers I've been crossed. waiting how, for how, this moment for a while. Good, good. Well, well, listen. Let's jump into it, man. Like, how's how's business? Well, let, you know, number one for people who don't know, right? Maybe you can tell people very quickly who you are and tell people sort of sure. about your company and how long you guys been around. Very quickly. Very quickly. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super quickly. So Shaper, yeah. Shaper, Shaper was founded in 2016, and uh, and our ambition is to uh, to uh, reinvent uh, the the design and manufacturing software industry from scratch, and and create a company that will dominate this this space for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And um, and um, we started with with an iPad Pro app, an iPad Pro uh, CAD CAD app. Uh, where we uh, with, a, with a mobile first approach, and now we are expanding to other platforms. Most recently, we uh, released Shaper 3D for Mac, and we are about to uh, publicly launch Shaper 3D for for Windows as well. And uh, and these are basically the the uh, the uh, the first step towards becoming a, a full featured 3D design tool for professionals, uh, transitioning from being just a sketching or ideation or prototyping tool to be, to become this full featured. Uh, tool for for professional designers, and and we are innovating both on the product and on the distribution side. So uh, so on the product side, I think even for for like probably for everyone, it's clear what we are doing if if you check out our website. But on the distribution side, I think it's it's equally exciting what we are doing because in an industry that is dominated by top down distribution bar networks, we built a consumer grade growth engine. That that allows us to uh, to run an incredibly cash efficient bottom up strategy, bottom up distribution strategy, cost, costing an extremely wide net and monetizing uh, a really broad range of customers from prosumers to Fortune 500 companies. So, so let me ask you a question. So this is basically you're you're following like the the product like growth strategy, right? Which is now yes. you know sort of I, I would say say the the predominant model for a lot of the start you know SaaS companies are actually you know you know I'd say in the last like two or three years this is actually where a lot of the growth companies have actually sort of like come from. Would yes, you agree? that's true. That that yeah, that that that's true. And uh, I think there is a lot of confusion around PLG. Like some yeah. companies call a great user experience PLG, but it's really not. Yeah, some yeah. companies call call a low touch sales model PLG, which is again not not PLG. Um, but and, and I think there are very few like real PLG companies out there. I think we are one of yeah. them. Give, give me give me give me another example. Give me another example of, of who you think like or tell me give me give me one or two examples of people you think they're doing a great job. I'm, just, I'm curious. Figma for his, Figma obviously like like they are they are probably one of the uh, one of the best examples. Loom is amazing. Yeah, Loom, uh, I mean Loom uh, has been crushing it, right? Like they're clear, clearly yeah, like like typically products that have some sort of uh, some sort of uh, viral rule built in to the to the to the way how the product itself works. So if the if the product is built in a way that it's designed for for sharing or it's designed for for collaboration these are the company or miro for example miro is a great yeah. example oh miro these, yeah, yeah. He's a, yeah he's a friend yeah they're he's doing super well <laughs> they're, they're doing really, yeah absolutely really well. <laughs> they're fantastic so these these are the, the typical products that are super successful with with plg yeah. Um. You know, I'm I'm curious, right? So, so you know, besides sort of like the 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 coordination slash sort of like team sort of like aspects of of sort of like your your product, why do you think it's working so well? I, it's always about like first of all, it's always about differentiation, and uh, and in in our space, it was it was it was just obvious that this is a this is a software industry that is ripe for disruption, and and it's. It's relatively, relatively straightforward. What are the things that are that could be done much better in 2021? <laughs> because these products are all all designed, or the traditional CAD products are all designed and 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 built or were built in the 1990s. And and since the 1990s, everything has changed. The way how we worked, our computers, how we collaborate, how 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 we do basically everything has changed except CAD. And basically, what we do at Shaper is we 
you're trying to identify these biggest trends or the biggest changes over the last 30 years that that allow us to uh to build something that is a better fit for for 2021 and uh and since really not a lot of innovation has happened in the last 30 years in this space there are a lot of these and it's relatively straightforward what are the things that we have to do to build a differentiated product so i i think this is this is really the number one reason the uh number two reason is is really the way how our distribution model works uh just by lowering the barrier of entry to 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 be able to to, to accessing a, a tool or, or or a software you completely change the dynamics of of how companies adopt new software or how people adopt new software, how people learn new software. Uh, and basically the combination of two, these two things, like the way how we think about differentiation and the way how we think about distribution, these are the things that, uh, the, the combination of these two things making shaper work. Yeah. How was uh, how was the pandemic for you? You know, did I, I assume you know, with the push for digitalization for a lot of companies, was it like, you know, I you know, you I knew you guys were growing, like we'd met, I think like two, three years ago, right? So I remember when we chatted, growth was pretty good already. I can't imagine yeah. growth would probably said slowed down, probably accelerated. How was twenty twenty for you and how was twenty twenty and twenty twenty one for you? So in in the beginning of the pandemic, uh we uh we got a pretty solid push um because the entire app store was was going like crazy yeah. and uh and uh and we got got some of uh, uh some of that as well um and and uh, like after the pandemic i'm not sure if this is this is the right thing to say but i think we are after the pandemic <laughs> so, Fingers so crossed. Around, we'll see no, i don't, I don't yeah, feel like see. that but <laughs> let's, let's, let's see but that, but around the uh so in the beginning of the summer, we slowed down a bit. I think people started to go out and, and they yeah. cared less about what's happening in the digital world and in, in computers. Uh, but but uh, actually now that summer is over, now now we are accelerating again pretty significantly. So we are doing doing pretty good. We are by far the most successful cat company in the last 30 years since, since SolidWorks, uh, which is quite incredible because we raised a fraction of what other other uh, startups raised in the last 30 years, and still we are by far the most successful, both in terms of financials and in terms of customer count. And, and tell me a little bit about sort of the big lessons that, that you got out of the last like year, right? So yeah, like, like we haven't, we haven't actually honestly, this has been great because we haven't caught up for a long time. So we can do the catch up now. Um, you know, what was the biggest lesson from last year? Because you guys weren't a fully remote company, right? We, um, yeah, we, we transitioned to, uh, to remote uh during the pandemic uh and i think that we learned how we were not uh we, we were not remote first or we were not remote friend not even remote friendly before the pandemic i think we learned how to do remote well i think that that remote is great but i don't think it's like i think the it's it's also not superior to uh to office-based working i think these are complementary certain yeah. things can be done really well uh in a remote environment by other things can be done really well in a, in a co-located environment. So, so going forward, we decided to have both remote teams and co-located teams. We are not, we are not uh, going to have uh, hybrid teams. So we will basically handle remote as a, as a hub, very similar to what Stripe did uh, before mm -hmm. the, uh, the pandemic. I think that's a brilliant approach. So basically remote at Shaper is going to be a, like another office. With, with remote processes, with remote management, like working remotely requires a completely different way of working. It's a, it's a bit like oil and water with co-located working. So, yeah. so we will want to be all in in remote working and we want to be all in with, with office-based working as well. And we would like to take advantage of both approaches. Yeah. How, how many people um, you know, is, in the is in your company right now and, and sort of what's the breakdown between sort of the remote versus sort of like um, co-located? So we are 110, and uh, most of the people we hired over the last uh, 80 months are still still uh, still in Budapest. But yeah. we have uh, we have quite a few very senior people, especially in engineering, who are who are not based in Hungary, and uh, and we will uh, they they are going to be the the foundation of of our, our remote team, and we are going to scale it up. Uh, but we are not. You're going to scale that 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 team up over the next six months. The uh, the full remote team in the remote hub, but uh, we will stay synchronous. So we are not. Uh, I'm not a big fan of async uh, async work. I think that that introduces a lot lot of overhead. I think again yeah. for certain things that's great, but it's 
it's uh, I think uh, at this stage for this company, I think it's much better to stay, stay synchronous. So we will hire from our time zone plus minus one hour, yeah, and yeah. Um, and and build the remote team from from that talent pool. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, where, you know, for just remote work has been an area that's been interesting for a long time. And, you know, I think one observation, just like it only works where you like you either do sort of like synchronous or it's like asynchronous. If you do asynchronous, like everybody has to be asynchronous. Right. And so it's just yeah. one of those things. It's like it's hybrid versus sort of like the fully remote versus sort of like in office where like you just can't half pass it. The hybrid is really, really challenging to work. Right. So absolutely. Um, yeah, so you have, I think as a firm, you know, for, for just for, for startup founders out there just who are thinking through this of just like you, you like most things in life, you can't half ass it or try to do both of just like you really need to be committed to doing one or the other. Um, that's the only way you can actually make it work. Yeah, exactly. And, and of course, you, you can't avoid collaboration between the remote hub and the and the co-located hub. I, and, and, but, but you want to uh, want to really well define what are the responsibilities and how those are split up between teams, because those teams are going to work completely differently. And if, if you if like the less overlap you have between the two teams, the, the better, probably. So, 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 you know, one, one of the things I know we had, one of the topics we had sort of thrown out there, right? Because, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a PLG sort of like SaaS play, but at the same time, you're not, right? Because like, you're not a, you know, you could be a consumer play, but the reality is that you're tackling, it's not like the, the typical sort of like SaaS play in the sense that you're going after a very, how should I say, sort of like old industrial, you're building software for sort of like a very, how should I say, traditional, um, industry, industrial, yeah. right? Like, like yes. um, which is very different, yes. right? Like, you know, who, which for the most part, you said to yourself, most of the sales cycles, most of the processes in the past have been very sort of like enterprise uh, or like reseller sort of like focus sort of like market. Yeah. So very, very different type. And so you've kind of flipped it on its head. Um, you know, what's yeah. it, you know, besides sort of the new sort of like distribution model, like what's it like and sort of what's the biggest difference, right? Because there are, you know, like I think a lot of the low hanging fruit you could argue in software has been kind of sort of gotten already. And so now you're going after sort of next layer of, yeah. of sort of more, yeah. I say challenging problems, I guess. Yeah. 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 So I, I think the, uh, the main difference is that, that you're, it, you have to be all in on this you're, So you can't really do this just a little bit. So either you build everything according to PLG and according to a, a bottom-up model, you you can't really like let's say you have a have a very traditional software, you can't just make it a great fit for for this approach because this approach has to define literally everything you do, including how you onboard your customers, how you think about customer experience, how you think about product design, how you think about uh, like like everything. Yep. And uh, and uh, and and this this is quite uh, I think this is something that is quite visible uh, when you when you look at Shaper like for example a large part of the work that that uh, VAR does a value added reseller does at the traditional cat companies to onboard the customer assist them with installing the software and 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 getting started and and uh, and we we have automated most of that. Uh, with with an in-app onboarding, with with email campaigns, with 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 uh, online tutorials, stuff yeah. like that, with automatically nurturing the customer. Um, also, I think uh, it's quite interesting to uh, to uh, you know if you, if, you, if you think about VARs, if you think about value-added resellers, um, the reason why it's not the right choice in 2021 to go with with them because the market has completely changed, like. This market is now an incredibly well-educated market. In, in the 1990s, most people, even who needed CAD, yeah. did did not know about the existence software wasn't of CAD. easy to use. Software wasn't easy to use it, back then. Exactly, and 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 most people didn't even know that they have a software solution for their problem. And it's there was there was no existing demand, so it was really just about educating the market and generating demand. Yeah. While in 2021, pretty much every single person who needs CAD has one. <laughs> so it requires a completely different approach. Like as and and you know, like replacing a CAD system, like the traditional CAD system, it's it's not that straightforward. It's like going to a, a software engineering company and telling them to replace their programming language. Like, uh, good good luck with that. Like, you would never be able to convince a, like this, uh, uh, a software engineering company to, to replace their programming language. If you want to be a replacement programming language for their existing solution, then you will probably start as a, as a, as a complementary programming language 
uh, yeah. for some some internal projects, and then maybe some modules are going to be implemented in that programming language, and then maybe eventually over five or ten years they will completely replace their legacy tools. And it's the same with CAD because these buyers are really well educated about the market. They know exactly what they want, and and their CAD systems are business critical tools for running their business. So attacking a market like this requires a, a very different approach. Right. And, and tell me about, you know, we've talked about all the good stuff, right? Now you guys have grown like crazy, you know, except for the summer, right? I think, I think most e-commerce and a lot of software companies took a hit this summer as sort of the, the world yeah. seemed to be coming back to normal in theory. Yeah. And now we're kind of back to the pandemic world. But um, I, I guess what's your, you know, like we don't want to, you know, I think we want to be sort of like real for a lot of folks here. You know, what, what, what were the challenges that you guys have had over the last year? Like, right. It wasn't all great. No. Um, I personally absolutely hated it. <laughs> it was it was it was it was a really really awful and and, and depressing period of time. I think uh, humans are are social creatures. We just need need each other, like like yeah. physically, like and over Zoom you can re reproduce these interactions. So I, I think uh, from 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 uh, from you know like from building the company's culture. As perspective, or from from the perspective of of building the the community, the backbone for the company, this was a really challenging period of time, yeah. um, which we which we have noticed. Like we have seen that engagement rate from uh, in the team was dropping. Like yeah. like people were were extremely exhausted, especially around the end of the pandemic. We have yeah, seen yeah. mental health issues in the company. But these are things that that happen pretty much at every company, uh, yeah. but. I, honestly, I, I personally I care a lot about the team, so yeah. for me this was quite uh, quite disturbing over the last last eighteen months. But but now it feels like that we had we had this three months of of transition. We uh we call this the uh, fuck COVID plan during yeah. <laughs> during which during which we let uh, everyone you know like like take a, a lot of time off as much as they needed and 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 regenerate a bit and and heal themselves a bit. And now I, I feel that the energy is now coming back to the team and and yeah. and and things are getting back to normal, which is amazing. I'm super happy about it. Yeah, and and I, I guess sort of you know you you scaled the organization also tremendously in the last year yeah. and a half or two, right? So what was the biggest lesson? You know, like this, you know, a lot of startups want to be in your, you know, I, we have a lot of startup founders on this this um this session. You know, what's what do you think is the biggest lesson? You know, or tips you would probably give them where you know like things that you're like, man, I wish I didn't do that, right? Or like things where it's like, wow, like, boy, I'm really glad we did this, right? So maybe some, some just some top of the, you know, sort of like top of mind tips of just like some things for, for any new founders sort of coming in who happen to be, you know, sort of fortunate, smart, lucky to sort of like, to sort of like start the scaling stage. Yeah, I, I think one of the best things that we did is that we, uh, we, we waited and learned uh, with figuring out how to go forward with remote and hybrid and co-located work. And, and we just, um, even until like, uh, four weeks ago, we were not hundred percent sure, like how to proceed and then what the future is going to be like. And I think that a lot of companies and a lot of people made this mistake that they draw long-term conclusion based on an extremely temporary period of time where everything was uncertain and you couldn't really predict what what was going to happen and i i mean i remember 18 months ago people were saying saying stuff like like you know like, this is the new normal even 10 years from now we are not going to have vaccines and the world has completely changed and i think this could not be further away from the truth and i think it was a really really good idea to uh, to wait a little bit more and understand how these events unfold and then make a much better and much better informed decision Eventually. So basically, don't panic. Uh, basically, net net is don't, don't panic. Don't panic. <laughs> yes, don't, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. And that, that was, I mean, now it's it's super funny looking back, but obviously, you know, like probably you also remember that that eighty months ago, like everybody was super anxious. There was a lot of lot of anxiety and and remember and when we left our Amazon excited. boxes out front for like a week? Yeah, <laughs> cleaning the groceries. Exactly, when exactly, you exactly, the groceries. Clean, exactly, exactly, right. <laughs> And so, so, so looking looking back now, it it it's, it looks funny, but it was really not eighty yeah, months yeah. ago. And and so, I'm not panicking and 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 thinking ahead a little bit. I think that was one of the best things that we did. Um, and and so, like I said, now you have this sort of like new form of you know structural organization. Um, you know, so 
not panicking, you know, sort of like trying to sort of like not overreact. Um, you know, what were the lessons you had in scaling, right? Do you think like besides the remote part, like what are the lessons you had in scaling? Scale, well, scaling, uh, the biggest lesson is scaling a remote team is tough. It's probably much harder. Than, it's much harder than, than scaling a co-located team because especially those parts of the, I mean, from some, some in, in some ways it's easier. You don't need more office space. You don't, uh, it's, you have a, a bigger talent pool and so on. But, but a lot of things that are crucial, like onboarding, getting to know each other, like getting yeah. contacts, learning about industry, these are extremely challenging in, in a remote setup. And you have to be very, very uh, intentional about these things. And you have to invest in these things uh, a lot, like, like, yeah. like, like extreme amount of time and effort. Um, and, and even when you are doing that, it's never going to be as good as doing it in, in a co-located uh, yeah. environment. So these, these are the things that I think were hardest in, in, in this remote uh, environment. And, and also, also creative collaboration uh, as you are, you are scaling up in a, remote, uh, in a remote environment is becoming harder and harder. And we, we try to reproduce our best practices that we had in the office, like those are not, not the right practices for, for remote collaboration and, 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 and creative work uh, in, a, in a remote environment. So there were quite a few things that we could not really figure out, to be honest, uh, during, this, during this time. Um, and, and are you guys doing a lot of like documentation, you know, a lot of like, you know, basic sort of like processes, you know, I, yeah. I, I tell most folks are just like, it's not as if you sort of like you set up remote and you kind of let everyone run wild and free. Like there's actually, you almost have to sort of think about this as have the processes of a company that's like three times larger than yourself, yes. right? Like, like you have to be super, super thoughtful, you know, yes. lots of documentation, right? Um, yes. Because yes. You know, th there is, th there is, there definitely is something of sort of like the advantage of being sort of co-located, just like you learn in some cases by osmosis yes. or hearing the calls and things and you don't have that, right? And so, you know, and yes. you also have to make sure that hiring actually, I would even argue becomes even more important because of you're looking yeah. for people that are like self-starters. Yes, absolutely. And, and that that's true. So we were always relatively good at documentation. So even before the pandemic, we had like super high quality documentation for product specs, for 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 um, for growth experiments, stuff like that. But so that that was not too shocking for us. The uh, the however the, the processes and the and the amount of management overhead that you need for 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 running efficiently at a remote organization it was staggering um so yes like and and and, and the information sharing because even if you have amazing documentation that doesn't mean that everyone is going to read it right <laughs> so you so you can be amazing at documentation if if if, if reading that documentation is not part of your culture then it then it's it's gonna be hard and and um you know um even if it's part of your culture like how what's the best way to decide what to read and what not to read you can't read every single document that that is being written in the company when you have 120 employees so yeah. uh it's it's yes it was challenging all these processes all the management overhead that was that was super hard and, and you know just if you were you know just looking back right of just sort of you know I, I want i try to draw these lessons and this is something i ask a lot of um startup founders too so you know it, you know it, it very you know to me at least it seems very very obvious that you found product market fit how long do you think it took you to find product market fit i don't think i don't believe in the concept of product market fit as a mm -hmm. as a singular event it's it i think it's you know it's something that that is constantly changing but i would say that our first big hit uh of product market fit took us like three years or so um or maybe even more like around i would say the middle of 2018 and we started in 2015. so yeah like three years roughly um which is normal by the way right yeah it's yes. normal yes it's just it's, just, it's just, for, just for all founders out there right just for all founders out there you know product market fit i haven't for me i haven't seen companies hit that earlier than two years it it takes yeah. a long time it's brutal yes and 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 there is always a next level of product market fit because typically like when you see these exponential curves these are typically not 
not by scaling a single thing up. Sometimes it is, sometimes, but most of that it's about building more and more and more on the top of what you have, and and maybe you know like being able, like uh, opening up the opportunity for opening up your product for other segments and even bigger opportunities. And these are layers. These are not these are not a single thing scaling like crazy most of them. Yeah. Um. So. It's it's not not something. Like, yeah, now we have product market fit, and now we just have to pour money into marketing and game over, right? <laughs> it, or 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 sort of those are the stories are cleaned up afterwards, right? When they don't talk about yes. sort of the multiple the multiple S curves of growth, right? So you know you almost yes. have to look at at sort of like different customer segments. And, and so tell tell me tell us a little bit more about you know as we dig into sort of your your business a little bit more. Tell us a little bit more about sort of like your core customer segments, right? Because you have like multiple customer segments, like you know the prosumer piece you mentioned. There's yeah. sort of like I would say there's, there's the mid tier sort of like companies. There's enterprise. You know you know yeah. where you know sort of these are all multiple segments. Where do you yeah. feel that you're very, very strong in and sort of like, I guess, what's the biggest, you know, sort of opportunity in front of you? Yeah. So, um, so Shaper is a product that is built for designing for manufacturing yeah. and that manufacturing technology can be 3D printing or CNC milling or injection molding or whatever else, right? And, um, however, um, especially bigger companies have extremely sophisticated needs when it comes to manufacturing. It's really, it's their core competency. It's something that is uh, a really expensive and a risky process. They have like, like you know, like, like they are super sensitive for, for the quality of the tools that they are using for manufacturing. So you can just sit down, build a full featured CAD system for, for the enterprise and then, then, then start marketing for them. So instead of that, we, we started as a conceptual design tool, as a prototyping tool, as an ideation tool, which was already a full feature tool for hobbyists, but it was a, a sketching tool or prototyping tool for professionals. And step-by-step, step, we were adding more and more and more features to, to gradually move up market, like from the hobbyists to the prosumers. Uh, now, now, now we are now we have prosumers and business customers. Mm -hmm. Now we are moving even 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 further towards towards business customers. We we have a, a broad range of of customers. We even have Fortune 500 companies, quite a few actually, that are using using Shaper 3D. But the use cases for these these uh, these uh, uh, different segments are completely different. So for a whole base. You're obviously a full feature tool. Now we are a full feature tool for prosumers as well, and uh, some like and, and a full feature tool for some segments in uh, in in the in our business uh, customers. Uh, in enterprise, we are definitely a, a sketching or ideation tool and not a full feature tool. But gradually, we are getting there, and step by step, we're moving higher and higher on the market. And and, and what do you what do you feel is sort of the biggest challenge for you over the next like I'm gonna say like one to two years? <sighs> Um, building the product, uh, a CAT system has incredible depth and breadth. It's, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's a feature play in, in many ways. So, uh, since the market is really well educated, they know, they know exactly what they want and, and how they want it. You can, you know, you just have to check the boxes and, yeah. uh, and since, since Shaper's core value proposition is the amazing user experience and customer experience, you have to build all these features in a way that they have to be delighting to use, not mm -hmm. just, so just checking the box is not enough. It has to, it has to be amazing. It has to be a wonderful experience. So that's, that's hard. And, and that's, that's why Shaper is quite engineering heavy and more than 50% of her headcount is, is in engineering. Well, um, the, the, uh, the, the other great challenge I think for a company is to, uh, is to uh, to scale further this bottom up approach, add uh, add more go to market functions. So until until now, we didn't really have any sales or any human intervention in our distribution. Now we are adding a customer success team, which will focus on on early engagement and and their KPI is going to be really just the like increasing engagement and increasing the success of the customers, and then probably six or 12 months from now, we will have to add the, an inbound sales team. And after that, adding a, probably an outbound sales team, so yeah, like yeah, scaling yeah. up and then continuously improving our, our go-to-market team is also a, a pretty massive challenge for the company. And, and what, you know, I guess as you think through this, right, like, you know, is the idea, you know, will you have a US presence or are you thinking about sort of like just, for, you know, doing this, you know, like I said, remotely? I think we can do this remotely. 
uh, most of this we can do remotely. Uh, for salespeople, you have to invest a lot in and customer success people. You have to invest a lot in educating them. But I think you know, like just uh, just just uh, you know, like maybe flying them here or going there for a couple of months and educating them, onboarding them, then they are they should be able to do this uh, remotely. So I think this uh, these teams are good candidates for 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 the remote hub. Um, also, I think that we probably at some point of time, I'm not sure when, uh, we will yeah. see how, how the pandemic unfolds from here. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, I think it will make sense to have a physical US office in the, uh, in the, over the next couple of years. Yeah. And, uh, and I couldn't be more excited about China. I know that a lot of Western companies are quite excited about China because they think it's a great market. But in our case, it's a bit different simply because we have basically <laughs> yes You're and we have basically, <laughs> yes and and we have basically no marketing in china and yeah. china we are we, we we are getting incredible traction in china like like uh like shaper 3d educational centers opening up in china <laughs> uh organically and we didn't do anything about it. we are getting pictures from our customers yeah. that I just participated in a cheaper 3D and course. And you're like, you're like, you're like, <laughs> you're like, <laughs> you're like what? <laughs> yes, yes, it, it, it's crazy. And and uh, and actually, in terms of downloads, China is the number one country for shaper right now. We, we are getting more downloads from China than from the US. So it's it's crazy, and we are quite excited. It's a whole different world, of course. So we will probably have to like have a joint venture. Uh, yeah, there. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a tough market. It's a it's a tough it's market. A tough market. Yeah. market. Yeah. Yes, but I mean it's, that's, it's that's a tough in, market. That that's incredible though that that you know like the the type of adoption where you have this like organic adoption where there's already it's almost like you're building this ecosystem of like somebody has gone and taken the initiative to sort of like build up like an education sort of like like sort of infrastructure for you guys in China, which is amazing. Yes, I I, I had a I had a chat with with one of the uh, one of the. Uh, biggest funds that have a very strong Chinese presence. And, and I had a chat with their Chinese leader and he said that he said that typically those Western companies that have this kind of organic traction without any investment, these are the kind of companies that can become successful in China. And Conva is one of the examples. Like Conva had exactly this. Then they set up a joint venture in China and, and now a very significant part of their revenues are coming from, from China. So I, I think Shaper is a good candidate for for Chinese expansion. <laughs> yeah, you you actually might be one of the very rare ones, to be honest. Like the more and more yes. I think about it, just considering sort of like your space, the uh, you know both there's the PLG piece and um and like I said, just China being sort of whether we like it or not, it's like the you know being sort of the the major manufacturing hub for the world. Um, seems yeah. like that makes a lot of sense, right? Like no brainer. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I think we're rounding up on the last sort of like, you know, I guess last minute, um, any final tips you have for anybody, you know, for, for young startup founders, what, what would any last words of advice that you want to share? Thank you. And by the way, this has been fantastic. So thank you. I learned a lot about Shaper today. Um, you know, any, any final feedback or advice that you would give to, to a new founder, startup founder? Never quit. Yeah. Just to grind <laughs> through it, right? It's a grind. Never you just got to grind yeah. through it. It's 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 the only thing that 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 you should never do is quitting. Like never quit. That's the secret sauce. All right. Well, listen, man. Thank you very much for your time. And um and by the way, if you're raising a round, man, let me know. Um, I'm I'm in the market. I'm investing now. So uh, let me know. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. Okay. Definitely. All right. <laughs> you heard it. You heard it first here, folks. Marvin's investing into Shaper Three D. So <laughs> yeah, if you let me, Breaking if you let news. me, yeah, yeah, if you let me. <laughs> great stuff all right all thanks right. for having me awesome yeah. thank you guys yeah this was really Bye. really a treat so thank you both and yeah never give up even when it comes to never logging in on hop in so <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly you